JK here for Sports Kita, and join me right now is one of the masterminds at Extreme Couture, Eric Nixick. Eric, thank you so much, man, for the time. You're sitting in Connecticut. You're there for Bellator this weekend. Who are you cornering? I got Ty Gorder. He's uh, he'll be the I think first fight on the main card. Okay, so with Ty, you know, what I mean, like he's been at Extreme for a little bit. You know, talk about his development and and what you're expecting out of him in this fight. He he was kind of the original like. Uh, you know, young kid getting brought up through the Uriah Hall, Brad Tavares school, you know, uh-huh. both of those guys took him under their wing and they use him quite a bit for camps. Um, and really, I mean, he's just forged under fire, like two of the best uh, middleweights, you know, that we had in our gym at the time. And, and th- those two just really took a liking to him. And you saw Ty's uh, skill set develop just uh, right away, you know, and, and he didn't really have a choice. It was like either sink or swim with those guys. So. You know, it really worked out for him in his favor. So basically, uh, a diamond in the rough. We just haven't gotten to see him on the big stage against, uh, you know, like a higher level opponents. But we will eventually in this Bellator bracket, right? Yeah, I think so, man. Like, you know, he started off 4-0, all four first round finishes. You know, and then obviously when you get to the big leagues, man, and you know, it's a, it's about matchups and, and how you're building off of your style and where, where are you getting better in the areas of, in the departments, if you will, of of where your holes are in your game. So, um, you know, we start getting that upper echelon guys and guys are going to try to come in and wrestle them. And, and that's where it's been a, been a the lear- learning curve. Um, so just trying to find the right style matchups for him, but you're definitely going to see him, uh, you know, climb that ladder at Bellator. For sure. And I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of other guys at extreme just like him. Could you name a couple more for us that we, ha- we don't know about yet? Yeah, man, we got, uh, you know, so the guys that's really not in the big shows yet, but like Montel Williams, uh, we just saw we just saw Juan Camilo getting into the big show, Ryder Newman on the Ultimate Fighter. Um, a lot of young up-and-coming kids. We have uh, Ernesto who just fought a couple weeks ago. But, you know, some of those veteran guys that now have uh, moved over and I think can make a name in, in other shows like Jeremy Kennedy. And we're seeing what Mads Brunel is capable of. You know, they weren't necessarily household names. But I think uh, you're starting to see what these guys are capable of in the room. All right, all right. Now uh, let's shift gears, you know what I mean? Last weekend, UFC 265, Ciro Gong goes in there, dismantles Derek Lewis, wins the title, interim title. Your overall thoughts on the performance by Gong? Uh, I thought he looked great. I thought he had a brilliant game plan, um, something similar to kind of what I thought they would try to look to execute was, you know, stay, stay long and try to frustrate Derek into um, – kind of chasing after him a little bit. You know, he has that almost kind of that McGregor stance where he's a little wide, a little bounce in and out, stance switch, things of that sort, but that incites to draw people in. And, uh, you know, I think he kind of kept him at the end of his range. And then, you know, here, here you are. Next thing you know, you're down uh, two rounds on the scorecard and you got, you know, you got to, you got to push, you got to do something. So that third round being that swing round, you know, you can kind of expect Derek to try to make a shift. And then uh, that's where he got caught. With how the fight played out, do you think Derek Lewis, in a way, was psychologically defeated by the third round? You know what I mean? Like, he, he you know, the striking differential was astronomical in that fight. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I, I try to look at, like, body language a lot and just see, like, how receptive they are. Like, sometimes pe- you can tell when people are down. You can read it on their body language and, and read it in their, in their mannerisms and stuff. And he did. He looked frustrated. You know, he's like, man, I, this is really what I expected. Um, and then, uh, I remember, uh, Bob, his coach, I, th- I thought I made, made a great adjustment too. I mean, he was right. He was straight up. He's like, dude, we're down two rounds. We're going to have to start doing something. So, um, that's where I wanted to see where him try to open up a little bit more, but it could also get him in trouble. And that's where, uh, we saw gone start just taking out his front leg. And then inherently you're just like, man, I got to try something. I got to do something. And that's where I think he just got a little bit of trouble with gone. He's so calm and cool and collected for a guy that doesn't have many fights, you know what I mean? And it's it's very comparable to even Francis, you know what I mean? Francis didn't have many fights either, you know what I mean? But he was very cool, calm, mm-hmm. but more of a, a a destroyer compared to Gon is, right? So it can you give that yeah. respect to him, you know what I mean? Like he, he has come up on those spots where, you know, there was a lot of pressure on him, but he comes through. You have to. You have to give him his respect. I mean, honestly, I thought the, the Volkov fight was going to be the most telling. Um, and what we were going to see, because, you know, here's a guy in Volkov who can kind of match him uh, tit for tat when it comes to the striking department. And, you know, he, he came out of that shining. And, you know, I, I felt like the Volkov, when you look at his, his resume, that fight to me stands out the most because of style matchup wise. So, yeah, you got to give the guy credit, man. He's he's looked amazing in this in his short career. When did Cyril Gaunt hit your radar? 
Um, it was, you know, I, I, I've, I've always kind of watched him. I, I remember the Tanner Bowser fight for some reason why I just, I remember watching like two like young athletic, a lot of movement, uh, heavyweights and moreover, just like kind of just watching their, their ideas and, and being athletic heavyweights, you know, seeing some of the stuff that they're able to pull off. And I remember that fight pretty distinctly. So he, he kind of jumped on my radar then and, and just watching the steady climb of what he's been able to do. And, you know, I, I definitely think the Rosenstroke and uh, Rosenstrike and uh, Volkov fights were very important for him in his career because you got to think that was 50 minutes of, of cage experience that he got. And that's just like going to college, you know, so you're starting to see the development and gives him time to work and work himself out in the cage. Um, you know, and that's invaluable for these young guys. With your time with Francis, has he ever said anything about guns? You know, like watch out for him. You know what I mean? He's going to eventually become a contender in this division. Not, nothing to those regards, but I mean, he's he's always showed his respects towards him and said he's, you know, he's good, he's talented, but it's never been like, we got to keep an eye on this guy. We got to make sure we're, we're watching him. But, you know, I think Francis always kind of has his eye on the division as it is. And, and I think that's what a, the champion should do. But um, in the past, he just, you know, he's always said, spoke highly of him. And, you know, there's never been anything other than that. Now, what do you think the timeline is for this unification fight? Because we have no idea you know what i mean like dana white doesn't seem like he's committing to anything right now yeah and ideally we would hope something for december maybe early january that would be the ideal plan but um you know francis has been in camp uh when we agreed agreed to fight Derek lewis for september um he we, we started camp that week and then that interim label got dropped on that this fight he hasn't stopped working out he's been in the gym every day training so um he's ready to go like whenever they just decide to give us a date we're, we're good to go, and, and he's home, and everything's uh, all systems go for us. So, man, the camp is just extended then, right? It's just like you stay. How do you do that? How do you keep a camp continuing and then kick into gear when they decide that there is a date? Is that how you do it? Yeah, usually you don't have to do like two-a-days at the moment, and I think a lot of times, too, when you're outside of camp, um, when, you're, when you don't have the luxury of knowing who your opponent is, you definitely want to try to start delving into the areas that you want to get better at as a martial artist. You know, even sometimes going back to things that maybe you've done earlier in your career, like throw the gi on or, you know, do grappling tournaments. Like Jeremy Kennedy has been doing some grappling tournaments in the, in like kind of the off season, if you will. But, but for, you know, two things that keeps you in shape and keeps your mind sharp. Um, even if you don't have a fight scheduled. So I think for like, uh, I don't want to get bored. You don't want to like keep doing the same thing over and over. Where it becomes, becomes monotonous. But like for Francis, we do now kind of for sure like 99% have a, have a matchup with God unless for some crazy reason why they throw a curveball at us. But um, that the nice thing is that you can start to really narrow down what you want to do for camp, um, the workouts and everything else without trying to be too strenuous. To, so it doesn't feel like you have like, man, it was at a 16 week camp. You know, I don't want to make it too long. So but you definitely want to make sure you when you get into camp that you're in shape and you're ready to go. So. I mean, camp getting your uh, getting your cardio up. Yeah, I think a lot of guys have made that mistake, right? And you need a coach like yourself to pull you back and say, "Hey, man, the fight is not guaranteed." And you said curveballs. The UFC is full of curveballs all the time, so you got to have someone there, kind of guiding you, right, and not, you know, not letting you get too crazy with with training. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think it's important to have those. We call them like deload weeks, where. You know, sometimes in an eight week camp, we'll have a, a maybe one or two deload weeks that we planned out on the schedule on the calendar. It's like, oh, man, like I'm, I'm eight weeks in and, you know, maybe there's a wedding or, a, or something to go to or, or a function that you can kind of break the monotony throughout the week. And you usually see your fighters come back rejuvenated and, and from that from that little time off, you know. So, um, you know, for us, I think just building that base layer, uh, kind of putting the ideas pen to paper and then and getting that cardio where we want it. Is all just going to help us when uh, when that, that that fight day gets announced. It was reported that John Jones declined the fight with Stipe Miocic, right? His coach comes out and says that Jones wants the biggest challenges. Do you think Stipe is not one of the biggest challenges in the heavyweight division? Because in my opinion, he is one of them, man. I, honestly, God, like I'm I'm a huge Stipe fan. I'm a huge fan of his camp. Um, love everything the guy represents. Uh, to, to be quite fair, man, I just feel like he's been totally overlooked and disrespected of the guy who's been known for the heavyweight go, you know, and, and what he's done for that division. Yeah. I mean, uh, Francis beat him pretty handedly, but you know, he makes a point. It was one, one. Um, he has been considered the greatest to ever do it at the division. And it's just, he's kind of an afterthought, man. And 
I think it just kind of shows you the way the, the sport is when you're out of sight, out of mind. It's like Francis just won the title uh, at the end of March, and then, you know, everybody – now he's the betting underdog, you know, against the Ogon. So it's kind of whatever's fresh in, in your head is what uh, most MMA fans remember. And, you know, Stipe has a gripe, man. I think he should be right in that mix. And even, even to be honest with you, fighting uh, Francis again for that rematch. Dana White, you know, when he says, when he's talking about John Jones, he's saying that we might not be seeing him until 2022. But, you know, Dana White, you know, I mean, he says things and that sometimes it changes. Does that mean the Jones fight could be still on the table? Do you think so? I do. I really do. Because, I mean, let's be honest with this. Like, Jay was like, it, that is the biggest fight you can make. Granted, like, Gone has, has moved the needle in the last few months and he's, he's changed a lot. He has, but when you boil it down, it's like you have the ability to make this super fight that everybody's interested in seeing. Why not make it now? It's the scariest man on the planet versus the pound for pound goat. Um, it just makes a lot of sense. I think value wise, it makes a lot of sense. It kind of reminds me of when uh, Pacquiao and Floyd were supposed to fight and they didn't. And then, you know, John Jones goes and fights Stipe. And if he loses to Stipe, that whole mega fight versus Francis doesn't have the luster that it has right now. So, um, I mean, I would love to be able to compete against a guy like that and, and a team like that. Like, that's what you get into the sport for is to compete against some of the best. And, and it would be nothing but an honor to be able to try to compete against a guy like John Jones. It's about making the fights when you can make them because when Adesanya was undefeated, they didn't make that fight with Jones. You know what I mean? That was one of those fights, those those super fights, the real super fights, you know what I mean? Like a Francis versus Jones. Couldn't agree more, man. It's like strike while the iron's hot, and these guys have the value to do it. Um, you know, I don't know the numbers. I don't know what one's offering or asking for or any of that stuff. But in my mind, I'm just like, man, pay these guys because they're going to be worth it in the end. Man, I get goosebumps when you were talking about Jones versus Francis, man. That's, like you said, man, that's the fight that, I think everybody wants to see. We'll see it's, what a, it's a win-win. It's mm -hmm. a win-win across the board. It's a, you know, if, if John loses to Francis, he lost to this, this juggernaut uh, in the heavyweight division and Francis loses to John. It's like you lost the pound for pound goat, you know, like, but everybody's happy. Everybody's making money. You know, it's what the fans want to see. So I don't see what the problem is in making that fight happen. Exactly. And rematches and trilogies, you know, the, those things come along too. Now, um, exactly. another guy, that's, uh, you know, a part of the team is Aljamain Sterling. You know what I mean? UFC 267, they're going back to Fight Island. He'll be defending the title against Peter Yan. You know, was that the ideal location for you guys as a team to go to fight? What is your opinion on Fight Island? Because there's people that are mixed about this place. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to get to, obviously. You know, you're, you're 16 hours and you're 48 hour quarantine and, you know, it, it just has a business, business like mentality to it. It's like, I, I'm here to go get my job done and go home. You know, there's really not a whole lot of like luster to it because you can't do anything when you're there. You're just pretty much stuck in a room, but you're halfway across the world. So, um, you know, it, it is what it is to me. It's just like, you're, you're kind of in that military where it's like, you don't know where they're going to send you, but you have a job to do. So that's kind of our mentality with it is wherever they send us, we have to be ready and be prepared for it. Aljamain, he was in Georgia on some trip, and then I think he's back at home in New York now. When do you guys get back together and, and start a camp for the first title defense? Uh, honestly, I, I haven't really uh, haven't talked to him much uh, in the last like month because I knew he went back home and everything else. But um, I think he's going to get back next week, and then uh, we can sit down and kind of iron out a schedule what he wants to do because you know last time he split a lot of time in between. It was um, you know Sarah Longo's, and he was out with us, and then back and forth. So. Um, I think each camp you should recognize on what you need and what you don't need. And, and he might stay back East more this camp. I really don't know, but um, I think as long as we're on the same page and have an understanding of what he needs, then I mean, it's, it's going to make things easier for everybody. For yourself, you are in the corner, you know, you have data accumulated four rounds of data against Jan. Does the approach change for you heading into this, this camp, if the camp stays mostly in Las Vegas? Yeah, it, it definitely does. I, I think there's some some really, really good things we can take from it. And there's some things that I think that we need to switch up and, and just kind of keep an eye on. Um, but the, I think for me, the biggest thing is to be able to have him 100 percent healthy. You know, he was dealing with that neck issue all throughout camp. And uh, prior to the first cancellation, when Jan had to pull out, um, you know, he was he was having a hard time with uh, with with his neck. So I, it was almost a, a little bit of a blessing in disguise that it got pushed back a little bit because we got more work. 
but um, you know, it also I just knew he wasn't 100 percent when he got in there. So now I feel I feel good knowing that he can he can train at 100 percent and train to his full capacity. You know, I think it'll be good for him. So what is your expectations? What type of fight do you see Sterling having against Jan in the rematch? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of the same premise that he had before, but maybe slowing the paces down a little bit. Um, of course, man, we have to we have to engage in the wrestling. It's just part of what makes Aljo striking better is is the threat of the takedown. Um, you know, and once he gets to your back and those passes that he has on top, he's uh, he's one of the best in the game. So. Uh, in my opinion, you definitely have to implore some wrestling in that fight just to just to keep Jan honest. And we saw what happened when he didn't really respect the wrestling going into three and four. He started picking Aljo apart. So, you know, we have to make sure we uh, apply it as much as possible. Now, another guy that has bursted onto the scene, part of your team, too, is Sean Strickland. He's going to face off against a former Strikeforce UFC champion, Luke Rockhold, UFC 268 in November. How big of an opportunity is this for Strickland? I feel like this is the first fight where he's facing a former champ. Yeah, man, I think it's a it's a great fight for him, and and he's his career and and everything he's kind of going through just re, it's like one big microcosm. The guy just works hard. Um, he does his job. He's he's never giving you an uh, an easy round in the room. You know, he's he is man. He just busts his ass, but you can see it now in his fighting style. Right. The way his work ethic and what he does in the room is kind of that that same thing he does in the cage. And he's just in your face. He's gritty. He's grimy. Um, and I'm really happy for him, especially in this spot where, you know, he's going to be fighting Luke Rockholt, who's you know, this is a tough fight for Luke. It's a tough fight for both of them. But, um, you know, Sean's got a lot going on right now and, and he's going to be a tough guy to beat at this stage in his career. Yeah, that that's a great point is like. At this stage in his career, Sean's career, compared to Luke's career right now, he's he was he's coming out of retirement basically to fight yeah. Sean. How dangerous is that though, man, for a guy that was contemplating leaving the sport, returning against a guy that's skyrocketing like Sean Strickland? Yeah, I think it just matters how much um, how much development you've had in that time, how much training have you been, you know, doing, and and what uh, what new skills are you adding to your to your arsenal. You know, did you just kind of go away and not do anything? You know, I, I don't know. It seems like he's been pretty active and staying in the room. But, uh, you know, the, th the thing with that is, like, if you're gone for so long, it happened to a lot of us when we were playing football. It's like you took a little time off, and then for you to kind of get back in the, the swing of things and, and back to training and doing all this other stuff, you know, it's like, well, I, I didn't really have to do this uh, the last few months. I was able to kick back and chill. Like, how bad do you want to get back? And I think that's the, the question that he's going to have to answer. Do you think stylistically for Sean against Rockhold, this is a fight that will, you know, pretty much put him in that top five conversation? It, it definitely can. And I think uh, uh, what you're seeing a lot out of Sean lately, um, which makes me happy, is because Sean is just more that, like, I'm just going to move forward and fight guys. And I feel like he's shown a little bit more of that fight IQ and situational awareness, the development in those, in those areas um, a lot better. And I think you're definitely going to need that against a guy like Luke Rockhold. You know, Luke, Luke is, in, in my opinion, not only a great striker, but he's one of the better grapplers you're going to see. So uh, he can take that fight from the feet to the floor and make, make it a problem for you. But, uh, you know, I think Sean, Sean's really been showing a lot of development in his uh, fight IQ and the understanding. And I think that's going to what he needs to lean heavy on in this fight. There seems to be some animosity between Sean and, and Luke now, you know, with the comments going back and forth. Do you feel like Sean is a guy that, you know, a lot of fighters, when they get angry, they kind of throw them off. But it seems like Sean is not like that, man. This was like, if he's angry, he's going to go there and try to kill you or whatever, yeah. you know? Sean, Sean has beef with everybody, bro. Like, there's it, the funny thing is, like, it's once a week with him. And then for a while, he was on a, he was on a stretch on a run there was like he fought every Russian in the gym. He was, you know, getting into these altercations with people left and right. And finally, I was like, Sean, have you, he's like, I can't, I can't train with anybody here. And I was like, do you know what the one common denominator is this whole thing? <laughs> you, buddy. You. I go, you're the fucking problem, man. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, he's uh, he's something else, man. Like, But there's something refreshing about him, especially this day and age. Is like, he's not going to be fake. He's not going to lie to you. He's not going to tell you something because you want to hear it. He's going to tell you exactly what, how he feels about something, and he's straight up about it. So, you know, you can you can love him, you can hate him, but uh, he's definitely you gonna get what your what his worth is that day for sure. I'm pretty sure you'll you'll be in the corner at UFC 268. It's gonna be in New York. I saw that New York is gonna mandate people 
to be vaccinated to, so they could go into restaurants. I'm feeling like this could affect or impact fighters and coaches. How much do you think of, of impact would, would this have? You know, I don't know. I, I've actually heard rumors that they might can that, um, uh, that fight there in New York because of that, that I heard they might move it. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I know, I know a good a number of coaches have been vaccinated and I know some that are, are just refusing to do it. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know where a lot of people stand with that. I ask a lot of questions. Um, I kind of want to know what my, my peers are doing, but uh, at the same time, I think it's, you know, it's, it's something that they need to stick to and, and do what they feel is right for them. I don't feel like it should be anything forced. So uh, I feel like the UFC is kind of on that same boat. And, uh, and if they're going to have a card somewhere where I think where they're forcing somebody to do something, I, I don't think the UFC will continue to have that fight there. You know, a lot of people this week, they're saying, oh, there's no UFC event this week, so we get to chill out. But for yourself, man, it's the same thing, man. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I think that's the that's the beauty of the sport is there's really no off season. You're you're always going. It's you know, like uh, John Anik says, you got to turn the page and it's the next guy up. You know, so uh, that's that's the fun part about you know being a coach is you're always on the go and there's always a, a new fight. Eric, man, I always appreciate you coming on and, and speaking with me and, and allowing me to pick your brain on a, so many topics. Thank you so much, man. Good luck this weekend. And, uh, man, good luck on the rest of the year, man. You got so many guys and so many fights. Thank you, brother. Yeah, anytime, Jay. It's good to talk to you.